The F and Rad Snowboard Podcast is presented by Vans. Season 7 of F and Rad is sponsored by Wired Snowboards, The Boardroom Snowboard Shop, and on Optics, Time Bomb Trading, and Tribute Board Shop in Nelson, BC. Tribute Board Shop at 556 Baker Street in Nelson is a must-visit destination if you plan to ride the BC's interior, which is home to legendary mountains and snowfall. Tribute offers a curated selection of snowboarding equipment and gladly shares their hard-earned knowledge on fit and performance with their customers. They also offer rental snowboards and split boards with skins, probes, shovels, and packs as well as offering snowboard tune-ups and repairs featuring eco-friendly wax, diamond stone edging, base and sidewall repairs all done by hand. Visit Tribute Board Shop in Nelson, BC or buy online from tributeboardshop.ca. Support for Season 7 also comes from Grouse Mountain, Mount Seymour, New Greens, which is the superfood greens drink sourced from North American Farms, GoPro, and Volcom Outerwear. Thanks to everyone who supports the show. Jamie Salter's contributed a lot to snowboarding over the years. He was one of the first businessmen to recognize that snowboarding was on the trajectory to become a worldwide phenomenon. He sat in meeting rooms with people like Jake Carpenter, Tom Sims, Mike Olson, and Chuck Barfoot, helping to decide the direction snowboarding would go as it grew. Ride Snowboard started as a partnership between Salter, Tim Pogue, Jason Ford, Russell Winfield, Jake Blattner, and several others, which made headlines worldwide when the company went public. Jamie's working with his sons at his Manhattan offices for his post-retirement project, Authentic Brands Group. ABG owns tons of brands, including Volcom and recently Reebok, and Jamie Salter is the chairman and CEO of the whole shebang. We set up an interview in a boardroom down the hall from his corner office overlooking Midtown Manhattan and Times Square. I don't make any mistakes. <laughs> okay, let's do this. So you're working like 20 hours a day? You sleep two hours a night or something? Uh, four hours. Four hours a night? <laughs> four hours. You four hear hours. yourself in there? You're good? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. It's a good level there. All right. Phil Allstar. <laughs> you know how to do this. You've done this before. Holy shit. Um, hey, 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 Phil, come over here. <laughs> that's my, that's my uh, heavy-duty lawyer right there. Nice. <laughs> Can I do this? Am I allowed to do this? Should I, should, I, should I be careful what I say? I shouldn't talk about any girls? No girls? No? No, no men? No men? No men? <laughs> Phil, I like your hair. I like your hair, Phil. <laughs> Phil, make sure you get a COVID test. Okay, let's go. All right. I, I'm excited. Uh, me too, man. Okay, let's start right at the beginning. How in the hell do you meet David Kemper or the Kemper brothers? Well, that is a actually a quick, quick, uh, great story. Um, David Kemper uh, reached out to a guy named Lance Brackman. Lance Brackman was my partner at the time in... Um, I think it was called Surf Paradise. We owned, uh, and we owned Whaler, Whaler, uh, windsurfers. And, uh, David Kemper reached out to Lance and said, Hey, you know, I'm in the snowboard business and, you know, we should get together and you should distribute my boards in your store. And David Kemper came to meet Lance. He was all of, I think, 15 years old. <laughs> and I said, Hey, how many snowboards have you made? He says, Oh, we made a lot. And I said, how many is a lot? He says, 35. <laughs> I said, 35. And I said, David, we'd like to do a deal with you. We're going to pay you $1,000 for each snowboard you've made. We're going to buy your business for $35,000. And we bought... Um, <laughs> I can't remember. We actually, I think we bought 95% and David kept 5% and we paid him $35,000. Holy shit. And that's how we bought how, how did, Snowboard. How did you know? Like, how had you snowboarded yourself? Had you been, did you see I had it? No it wasn't idea. Anywhere. What year are we talking? Like 86 or something? 86. Yeah. And there was, he brought the snowboards in and they had uh, um, a, like a little metal. Uh, whatever you call it, edge skag or, or whatever, skag or yeah, something yeah. like sort of like this little metal thing that 
you, you know, today you would, you would find it in your toolbox. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, there was there were two of them. They were clipped, you know, sort of to the back of the board. Yeah. And that worked as sort of, you know, to carve and to dig in and stop or whatever. Sure. Yeah, it didn't work. And but, I said, yeah. how come like there's no like metal edges like snow skis? Oh, Mr. Salter, you know, they don't make these like they make snow skis. They make these like they make skateboards. Right, right. Right. And, yeah. and I said, okay, I know how to make skateboard. I used to make skateboards when I was in school and, you know, you get the fiberglass and the wood and the plywood and you'd make a skateboard. And he said, yeah, we make them the same way. I said, oh, well, why wouldn't you make them like skis? No, no. Again, I told you we don't make them that way. I said, well, we should make them like skis. Yeah. And uh, he goes, well, how are you going to do that? I said, well, we should go to Austria. And try to figure that out. And I did a bunch of research and there was no such thing as the internet back then. And uh, I figured out that there was a company in, in, in Austria um, making snowboards. They were making Crazy Creek, Crazy Banana, <laughs> Nitro, and Burton. Wow. And that was a company called Palais. Palais, yeah. And uh, they were making snowboards. So... I went there and uh, uh, I remember I, I got off the airplane and they picked me up and drove to St. Stephen or, you know, and I went into this uh, factory and met this guy. His name's Walter Canada. And I said, Walter, and he was wearing his vest and the whole thing. It was, <laughs> I mean, like you look back and you go, this is like right out of a movie, but, you know, he's total Austrian. And, uh, I said, how many snowboards you make? He says, oh, I make 15,000 snowboards a year. I said, really? That's a lot of snowboards. And how much are they? And he told me the price. And I said, great, I'll take them all. <laughs> he said, you can't buy all the snowboards. I have other customers. I said, no, no, really? You can put on a night shift, you know, do something. I'll take all 15,000. He says, you're not serious. I said, no, no I'm serious. I'm serious. He says, where are you going to get the money? I said, I work for this guy, Lance Brackman, you know, the father's in the real estate business. They're really rich. Don't worry. We'll, we'll come up with the money. He says, kid, I like you. I'll take the order. And uh, he says, how many styles you got? I said, what do you mean styles? Don't you have the styles? <laughs> I said, I, just, I, I think that we need these to have a high tip and a high tail I said, because most of the boards that I've seen are kind of flat and we need to make it like freestyle. He says, why, why would you say that? And I said, well, because I'm a freestyler and I, you know, have skis that are turned up on the, on the front and they're turned up on the back and I can do helicopters with them and I can do all kinds of funny stuff on these skis because, you know, the tips are turned up and the tails are turned up. Yeah. So why wouldn't we just make a freestyle board? Yeah. He says, what are you going to call it? I said, I'm going to call it freestyle. <laughs> and I made the green. Okay. You, yeah. were, you remember the board. Of course. And Noah was, Selaznick know, wrote it. Right. It's so iconic. Yeah. And, and yeah. I made the camper freestyle board. That's incredible. And, and, and that's what it was called, the camper freestyle board. And uh, that started our my career. And he goes, how are you going to sell them? I said, I haven't figured that out yet, but don't worry. I'll figure <laughs> that out. And I went to the ski show. Um, I remember I got a 10 by 10, uh, booth in Vegas, in Vegas. Yeah. And we sold all 15,000 boards in three days. Are you kidding me? And you know, who did we sell them to? Well, we sold them to specialty retailers. We sold them to big box retailers. We kind of sold them to anyone that had a pulse cause we didn't know any better. Yeah. And, uh, Jake Burton came over to me and may he rest in peace. And he, you know, he's my mentor friend, um, I can't say enough amazing things about Jake, but Jake said, why are you selling the big sporting goods guys? So why wouldn't we? I mean, they sell canoes, they sell, <laughs> you know, mountain gear, they sell ski wear, they sell snow skis. Why shouldn't they sell snowboards if they sell snow skis? He says, well, they don't really like snowboards on the mountain. I said, why don't they let snowboards on the mountain? He says, well, there's a few, you know, we've been lobbying them. I said, well, aren't snowboards good for the mountain? They sort of pack down the hills and, you know, they're sort of like 
you know, the tractors that go up and down like the cats. And he goes, well, that's a positive way of looking at it. <laughs> I said, I think all places should allow snowboarding. I don't see the big deal. And I really got on the Rick Alden train. Okay. You remember, you remember Alden was there. Yeah. And I, you know, I said, let's, I'll help. Yeah. And I started to lobby, you know, the, the ski resorts. And I started with Blue Mountain in, in, in Ontario because I lived in Toronto. It's one of the first places I snowboarded. Right. It's great. And, yeah. And I, so yeah. that's where I sort of started to lobby it. And I went to Gord. I think his name was Gord Cannon or Gord something. And I said, revenue, like money. You, yeah. you can charge these people. Yeah. I, he says, no, no, they're bad people. They smoke dope. <laughs> Funny now, look back, eh? Right, everyone's smoking dope yeah, now. Yeah, but the, the 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 funny thing is, is he said, no, 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 you, you, it's not going to work. Right. I said, why don't we divide up the mountain a little bit? Let's let the snowboarders use certain parts of the mountain. Yep. And if skiers want to go there, they could go there. They could mix with the snowboarders, but the snowboarders can't mix with skiers. Yep. Let's see if that works. And of course. Gord started to allow it. Snowboarding picked up like right away. Just instantly. And of course, yeah. Gord was getting everybody at Blue Mountain. And very quickly, he opened it up to everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, then we started in Colorado. And I think Breckenridge was the first one or Loveland or Loveland, Pass. Loveland I think. Loveland Pass. You know what? So, good snow there. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't been to Colorado. I might go this year. I'm hoping to go. We started to really push you know, everybody. And then Vail came on and that was, that totally. was big. So when yeah. Vail came on and the reason Vail came on is because Breckenridge was eating up their business for lunch because everybody wanted to go snowboarding. Everyone wanted to try it. And of course, you know, back in the day when like all the young kids, they, they, they didn't even want to ski anymore. They just wanted to snowboard because it was free, like not free as in like free, but it was like you felt free. And it really started to get a great reputation with the younger generation. And then some of the, you know, older people started doing it. Now, look, I was all of, you know, early twenties when I, when I started this, but I can honestly say that it was just, it was like 1969, even though I didn't know what really 1969 was. Cause I was seven, you know, six years old, Yeah, yeah. but it, it was fun. And it, there was no tension and there was no stress and people really enjoyed each other. And the snowboarding crowd, people started taking a liking to these people. Like they're happy people. Totally. And, and I think that, you know, snowboarding got a bit of a bad rap at the beginning. Yeah. Because they were free and they were, they <laughs> you look at today, the whole world. Okay. is like this. Yeah. Yeah. Where, yeah. where, they just sort of, I'm not going to say they run wild, but they definitely, you know, people want to do what people want to do. Yeah. Yeah. So I really liked my snowboarding days um, because it really taught me how to think out loud, think creatively and be who Jamie Salter is today. I mean, <laughs> I am, Sick. I'm all about, you know, being a happy person, having a fun time and no idea is a bad idea. It's just an idea. Yeah. And if you really believe in it, you should go for it. And that's, that's what snowboarding was all about. What was it about snowboarding that you believed in? Like this guy's got 35 wood boards. He probably handmade in his garage, right? Like it's not like he, he got them manufactured somewhere. You just, you just could see surfing on the snow was going to be the thing. Well, truth of the matter was we didn't make a lot of money in the winter time. <laughs> Okay. Oh, we were selling, wind we're selling stuff. wind surfers yeah, yeah, and yeah. we kind of needed to sell something in the winter. Yeah. Well, as you know, snowboarding just completely took off. Okay. Like, yeah. boom, we were one of the, you know, first people in the business. Yeah. Chuck Barefoot, you know, there, there wasn't like 300 companies. Okay? And you locked into a really good board, like the Kemper Freestyle out of the press, probably the best board of that era. For, it, yeah. For sure. Right, like in the second generation, the blacktop one. I tried to get the I tried to get the one fifty five mini when I was a kid, and they, they said it was I was too big for it. <laughs> it's like the size I ride now. But um, 
Yeah, those boards were epic. What about the Sun Ice? Um, like, did you learn something okay, there with, yes. with licensing with Sun Ice? No, I didn't learn anything about licensing. What I learned was Fred Nykamp, okay? And Fred, you know, he actually, he called me, I guess it was about six months ago and wrote me this really long letter like I was mad at him. And I, I really was never <laughs> mad at him. But, you know, we never hired him when I when I started ABG. Mm. But Fred was running Sun Ice at the time and I called him up and I, you know, big giant company. And yeah. I said, hello, Mr. Nykamp, how are you? And I said, I know you sell a lot of ski jackets, but you don't really sell a lot of snowboard stuff. Nobody does. And he goes, well, no, no, they buy the ski stuff. I said, no, no, they buy the ski stuff because there is no snowboard stuff. Yeah. And I yeah. said, let's make snowboard gear. Let's do a collaboration. Okay. That's where I learned about collaborations yeah. way back in Sick. sort of, you know, 87 when we, we started with Sun Ice and I, we, had this great relationship in Sun Ice and Kemper, you know, in the Kemper One Piece, and the, the you, you remember those jackets? Oh my, yeah, my kids still have those jackets Come to this on. day, and they they sort of wear jackets. them at uh, Telluride on Retro Day. Yeah, but yeah, we of course we formed a phenomenal relationship, and Sun Ice, you know, for years, multiple years, was doing phenomenal with the with the brand Kemper, you know, on the outerwear yeah business. But then, of course, many outerwear companies, you know came around and Sun Ice didn't really keep up with the style and, yeah. and and what they were doing, to be honest and truthful, they were taking ski jackets and making them a little bigger, a little baggier. Yeah, I was going to ask, did you have a designer or were they, you they, a designer? No, or they, they, they were doing it and, and yeah. they, they really, they should have gone out and hired a real snowboard Absolutely. clothing designer yeah. and they didn't do that. They, they should have talked to their team. I mean, Hetzel and Salaz, like real snowboarders were on that Kemper team. A hundred percent. Yeah. Huge guys that would have told you, no, we want our jackets to look like this or whatever. But yeah, the Sun Ice thing, they were the cool brand of skiing. And then you brought them on as the, as a snow jackets. It just made sense. So yeah, the collaboration, had you done something before that as a collaboration or was that the very first one? That was the very first one. Yeah, that's very perfect. First one. Yeah. So then, okay. So Kemper some, somehow all of a sudden they showed up as like clear out. It was the very first snowboard clear out. I think I bought a board from Mad Mike's yeah, for a hundred bucks. I mean, look, the truth of the matter is we made a few snowboards that, uh, in my opinion, I mean, actually I chatted with you the other day about this that yeah. you thought they were good boards. Oh they, yeah. They were sure. not, they were not, they were not so good. <laughs> and, uh, those were more on the sort of slalom side. Yes. And they were more for racing. It was the bullets and, and the they aggressors. Were, you know, yeah. bullets yeah. and yeah, yeah, going yeah, yeah. fast and they yep. were too stiff. And yep. I gave you all the things that David didn't like about them. Sure. Truth be told, you know, I mean, as time went on, you know, those, those boards were actually not that bad. No, of course. But, we had a lot of inventory left. Okay, so you just year. dumped it, and well, we didn't dump it, but you know, we you know, we marked it down, and yeah, and we sold it aggressively, and right because at that time, almost every single brand is just like they're selling out in you know September or whatever, and you can't even do reorders because everybody, nobody's taking the big numbers like what you're doing. Correct. Right? Like you know, yeah, I think we were, we the were first stuck guy to with do big uh, numbers. You know, maybe we're stuck with. Uh, 2,000, 3,000, yeah. 5,000, but it was not like yeah. today it would be like nothing. How long did you have Kemper for? You, you so kept Kemper it for- Kemper was 86 to 1990, got sold okay. by the way, and yeah. uh, got sold for a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, got sold, I think for five or $6 million. <laughs> A lot of money back then, right? Yeah. Now it's ninety, and and yeah. and we sold it. We we sold to a company out west uh, in California called uh, Neil Pride, a guy named Armin Gagorian. I know Neil Pride, yeah, in the windsurfing, in the right. windsurfing business, yeah. And we sold it to them, and they paid for the business, and they asked if I would move to California. Yeah, and uh, I said, okay, I'll move to California, um, but maybe I won't. Mm, so sometime around that time, I was offered to be the sales manager or head sales manager of Burton. Wow. And Jake offered me, um, it was $80,000. Like, wow. And I went to my wife and I said, <laughs> oh, we're going to go work for Burton Snowboards. And Would you gonna, move to Burlington then? And you're going to move to Burlington, yeah. Vermont. And yeah. It yeah. was like, 
there's a big job and it's way more money. We're only making 40 grand right now. This is yeah. like double my salary and Amazing. a bonus. And I'm going to, you know, I, I'm going to be the president of Canada. And like, this could be like, wow. Yeah. And, uh, so I went, I interviewed, you know, met with Jake, met with Donna and, uh, came home, went to my boss. I said, sir, I think I'm going to take this job. He says, don't take it before you sell the business. I said, no, 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 we'll sell the business. We'll, we'll get a transition. We'll do what we're supposed to do. But then I flew out to California. I really like California better than Vermont. <laughs> and my wife really liked California better than Vermont. And uh, the nice thing is, is they paid me $80,000 they're actually, they paid me more. They paid me a hundred thousand dollars. Holy jeez! So I was actually making more money. Yeah. And Kemper uh, came on even stronger yeah. as, as everyone knows. Um, but I did that for really only one year. Yeah. And the reason I did that for only one year is a great, great time with Armin, but I was driving from Glendale to Calabasas and, you know, I had, uh, my son, Corey, and I had Matt and, you know, two kids and my wife and not a lot of friends in California because we just moved there and I was getting homesick and my wife was getting homesick and, uh, she wanted to move back to Toronto and I decided, uh, it wasn't going to work out with, uh, Armin. I didn't really like Armin's partner either. Uh, tell the truth. Yeah. And uh, Armin was amazing, but his partner was a little strange. So it, I said to Armin, I'm going to leave. So I left on good terms. I helped him out. Um, but while I was doing that, I started a company called Cass, and which was Corey Adam Salter is what it stood for, Cass Sports. Right. And Cass Sports, you know, was buying and selling, you know, sporting goods. And while I was doing that, I, you know, said, you know what? I really like snowboard business. And I called Tim Pogue. So how did you know Tim and his wife? Um, well, because Tim was working for me at Kemper. No way. Before he went to work for Burton. Yeah. No, after. After. Oh, he left Burton. He was the Burton team manager. Burton. Yes. And I called him when I was at Kemper and I said, you got to come work for me. That's oh, how sick. I built up such a great team at, yeah. at Kemper was through Tim. I owe all that to Tim. Yeah. Tim, was, Tim was the brainchild, you know, sort of, a, you know, the roots and who, do, you know, which, which riders are great riders. And I said, Tim, I want to start a snowboard company again. And he said, you know, well, yeah, let's do it. And I said, <laughs> well, what are we going to call it? And he says, I don't know. What do you want to call it? I said, what do you do? Like, like, like what is snowboarding? Like, what do you do? He goes, well, you ride snowboards. And I said, right. What a good name. <laughs> yeah, That's yeah. a great yeah, name. Yeah, you yeah. ride snowboards. And yeah. I said, but won't Joyride get mad at us? And he says, who cares? Who cares? <laughs> I said, I agree. Who cares? Joyride, ride. It's good. It's, it's, it's fine. Yeah. And I said, it's kind of a good name, Nick, because think about it. We could do ride bikes one day. We could do ride oh, yeah. and ride skates one day. Right. We could do ride skateboards. We do anything with movement. Could you be ride. Could, yeah. could be ride. Right. So I kind of like the name ride. Let's do it. So he goes, we got to move to Seattle. I said, why? He said, way better. Way better than California, closer to the mountains. And it's just, it's just better. Yeah. I said, okay. And, uh, this, this is like 1992, 91, 91. 91. Holy. Yeah. Like grind, 90 or 91. Seattle's still like, I mean, it's, it's kind of a small place compared to like big California, you know? So there's a guy yeah. there. His name was Roger Madison. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, Roger was like, uh, first of all, Tim said, where are we going to get the money? I said, don't worry. You know me. I'll find the money. <laughs> and, uh, so I called Roger. I said, Roger, I know you're going to buy nitro snowboards. <laughs> I, I, you know, and he was in the sun tanning business. I said, I got a better idea. You shouldn't waste your money buying nitro. We, you should come partners with me and Tim and, and be a part of ride. And he goes, well, what is ride? I said, no, it's going to be the biggest snowboard company out there. I don't you like it's, it's, I got the right guys. I mean, I know how to do this and I convinced him. 
he was a big businessman at the time. Yeah. I mean, at least he thought he was. <laughs> so uh, we set up a company called it Ride Snowboards. And I said, okay, Roger, we need some money. He goes, well, I don't have any. I said, no, no, Roger, no, no, no. <laughs> we really need some money. And uh, he says, well, my business is not going so well in the tanning business. And I said, Roger, fine. You own 60%, I own 40. I now own 60, and you now own 40. He goes, where are you going to get the money? I said, don't worry. Called my brother. He's a banker. I said, I need money. He says, how much? I said, two and a half million, only two and a half million. <laughs> and uh, he said, okay. Called Corey Heckler, my best friend, today. And I said, Cor, hi. I know you're my brother's friend. I need to borrow two and a half million dollars. How much you can charge me? He says, how much can you pay? I said, I pay you 10%. He said, 10% a year? I said, no, 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 10% a month. He says, you're going to pay me, you know, 250000 I said, I'm going to make two and a half million dollars selling these snowboards. Of course, I'll pay you $250,000. He goes, I'll make it better for you. You don't have to pay me $250,000. I'll just lend you the two and a half million dollars. Pay me back when you can. Well, wow. I said, Cor, you're great. I paid him back literally a month or two months later. <laughs> and they became my sort of source for, for money, my brother and, and Corey. And now, fast forward, we're now like 92, 90 in going into the second year. And we're doing $25 million in business. And we, like, I, I got core, Mark, I mean, okay, they're still helping me get the money and they're figuring it out. And my brother finally comes to me, he says, I think you're ready to go public. Already, after and, one year. And, and I said, okay. And he says, because you need money. You, you, you yeah. need some real money. And I, by 93 yeah. or 94, maybe it's 94, we're doing $250 million. And uh, me and Tim, you know, we, we're, we're not the biggest businessman in the world, <laughs> either one of us. But, you know, we, we work 24 hours a day. Where did and, Jason, Jason fit in in this? Well, he, J, J, Jason Ford, yeah. you know, that was our claim to fame, right? Yeah. Like we yeah. got Jason Ford and yeah. when, when we got Jason, it was like, you just got Burton's best rider. You're, you're, you're set. Yeah. And Jason really helped take the company up, but we couldn't afford him. Right? right. So I said, Jason, you know what? I'll give you a little bit of money, but I'll give you a piece of the action. Yeah. So we gave him stock in the company he said that he had he had to like borrow money from friends and family and everything they, they he said you offered him for 10 grand maybe twenty thousand shares or something like that i forget what something like, and it turned out to be like two hundred fifty thousand dollars or something way or, more or way five, more. i don't even know millions millions because it went million, to because million. it went to 40 bucks a share right well, it went to 40 bucks a share but remember it split two for it, one it split, so right. so it was really like 77 would yeah. have been the high point of of ride he said um, that he he called a stockbroker and he goes, he's just a kid, right? Like he's a 20-year-old snowboarding kid. His but, check to you guys. a good guy. And, and a, a really good, good guy. guy. Yeah, and a smart person. And well put together. Yeah. He said he put together the $10,000, but the first check he gave you guys bounced. And he was like, no, there's the money's in there. It really is. And you guys honored the second check or whatever. And he so he's looking at the screen on the TV and ride. And that was all anyone was talking about. And I don't just mean snowboarders. I mean the world. They were like, there was a snowboard company that is, has gone public. And we were, and yeah. it's going like insane. It's like, the, it's the best, it's the most talked about stock of 94 or whenever it goes. Third best performing stock on the NASDAQ. It was iOmega Zip Drives, AOL, <laughs> and Ride Snowboards. That's unbelievable. So he calls a broker out of the blue and just says like, Hey, I got like 40,000 shares of this or 20,000 shares of it. And the guy <laughs> FedEx him the next day cell phone. He's like, you're going to need this. You're a millionaire, dude. And he's like, what? He had no idea. You know, he just didn't know. He didn't know what he had bought. He had no idea what the, how it worked. So how do you change as a person when all of a sudden this thing explodes exponentially to where you're, you're managing hundreds of millions of dollars? Well, 
the first thing is I brought in a board and had a really good, strong board. And I said, we want to, want to, uh, expand the business into multiple categories. And, um, Tim vetoed me on that. Yeah. That probably was our first big disagreement. Um, yeah, because Tim, it, there is a, there is a thing in the snowboard industry, a kind of limiter, which is this community thing, right? And I'm sure you would have heard that from Jake. You know, you would have been in meetings where everybody around the table, you know, Chuck Barfoot, Jake, the Mervin guys, anyone who's owning a snowboard company that's that's got this idea of community and riders, a rider driven company is going to try and stay away from the sports authorities of the world. And, and, and of course yeah. I was, and you were the exact, you're the opposite. opposite. You're the opposite. So you're sitting in these, meetings. I was the commercial guy. Yeah. You're sitting in the meetings going, Oh my God, I can't believe I'm the only one here. That's going to actually go after where the real, where the real chunk of I, I, it was, money it, is. it wasn't the chunk of money. It was the customers. Yeah. It was the customers. And what I tried to explain to, to, to Jake and Chuck barefoot. Yeah. As I said, guys, I get it. And, and, and I'm the biggest brand snob there is out there. Sure. But if you want this business to go mainstream, right, you need to talk to mainstream customers. Mm -hmm. And if we're not going to talk to mainstream customers, we're going to be limited how much we can grow. Yeah. Now at the end of the day, you know, Gucci or Yves Saint Laurent is a great company, but they sell one particular customer, very wealthy luxury customer. And it, you know, snowboarding at the time was selling to a very limited amount of customers. And I wanted to take it to the family and not just the cool dude or the cool girl. I wanted to take it more to the kids and the mothers and the fathers. And the only way of doing that was giving them a platform where they could shop. Yeah. And that platform was sports authority. Sure. Um, it, you know, it, I don't even think it was called sports authority then it was called guard sports. Yeah. Garts and big five and Dunham's. We took the same approach as the ski companies and the ski companies were already there. They, yeah. Yeah. I mean, ski, yeah. if you want to buy a pair of skis, you went to Garts. If you yeah. want to buy a pair of skis, you went to Dunham's or Dick sporting goods or whoever was, you know, in, 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 at the time in the ski business. So we, we really just took the same approach to skiing, but here's where the problem was. Everyone had different ways of putting the bindings on. Absolutely. And that was a problem. And the reason that was a problem is because, you know, who's the tech, right? Right. And so we did seminars, you know, here's the camper way that you're going to put the bindings on and here's the Burton way. And, you know, here's the Chuck barefoot way. And, yeah. you know, I called up. Jake or Jake called up me. I don't remember. And I said, Let, let's kind of put some sanity here. Yeah. Let's all come up with one way. I mean, on ski bindings, there's only one way, right? Yeah. There's four holes. You put them in, boom. And, and, and every ski company knows where, where those bindings go. And they, they put the metal plates in there. So the bindings, you know, sort of yeah. go in. Yeah. I mean, later on in life, they, they, they sort of changed it a little bit, but they integrated it all. But if you really think, that wasn't done in the snowboarding business for, you know, really, I would say, I don't know if it's 10 years in, but it, it was a while. Yeah. So yeah. we, we, one day, you know, four holes, six holes, eight holes, uh, sliders. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. mean, they had it yeah. all. Yeah. And we finally all agreed, you know, four holes. Yeah. Great. Four holes works for me. Yeah. Um, and that made it easier. Way it made easier. it way easier for us, made it way easier for the retailers uh, made it way easier for the consumers to understand. By the way, someone's binding broke. It was easy. You could buy another binding. Totally. Right? You could, you didn't have to buy a Burton binding to go on your Burton board. You could yeah. buy a, a ride binding to go on your Burton board. You could buy a Burton binding, go on your ride board. It just made life much, much easier. Yeah. And I think that that sort of helped the business. And, you know, over time, we got more and more respect um, at, at ride and, 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 and people sort of like sort of what we were doing. The bindings kicked ass too. 
separating the bindings from ride bindings I think that for was a while. Mike Tadjo, right? And Mike Tadjo was the binding guy. I don't know. Yeah, I know that there was Preston, right? Like, so they started with ride. Then they decided we're going to do a kind of like, we're going to call the bindings Preston. Maybe just so that you didn't well, that, even that think was, where that was, that was Tim. You could put them right onto Burton boards without right. thinking like, oh, these don't go together. Oh, it's just a binding company. It goes on every board. And, and when, then we had Capel. Clothing, oh, that was so right? sick. And, yeah. you know, that's when we were dressing up women, okay, in men's clothes yeah. because uh, Tim thought that that was a good marketing idea. It actually worked. It worked. Yeah. I mean, for my generation, Capel, like, it still brings up the imagery. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, it, it, was, it, was, it, was it was an was, incredible was campaign. Yeah. Yeah. And the pieces were like cutting edge, kind of fashiony, but like still functioning Look, materials. It was Tim, awesome. Tim, Tim, Tim was great. I mean, yeah. and, and, Tim just, he saw it. He, he had great creativity. Um, unbelievable wife. Steph was still one of my favorite people in the whole wide world. Rad. Uh, they, they were just, they were, they were, they were great. And, and, and look, I can honestly say I'm still with my wife today, you know, almost 35 years later. And we were a family. We were all a family. We all worked together. We, we, we played together and, you know, we went to each other's parties and it was just, it, it, it was a real family atmosphere. And, and, and I learned that, you know, early on at ride and, you know, today at ABG, I think if you go around and talk to every employee in this company, they're going to say yeah, this is a crazy place, but it's run like a family. And you know, the, the father yells at the son, the son yells at the father. <laughs> and, 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 but we have a lot of fun here. And I think that that that's important in business, right? That culture, you know, yeah. making money, you know, that's a scorecard. Yeah. Having fun. That's really, really important. And I think that we, we had a lot of fun and that's why ride went great. Now I'll tell you though, um, you know, once we went public, that's why my son always says, dad, never go public. <laughs> but the re reason it got, got different. It got different. It was about numbers. It was about, it was, you're beholden to shareholders, you're beholden to yeah. shareholders, quarterly reports, uh, quarterly reports. Stuff. They don't like the bindings or they don't like uh, the colors on the board. Oh no. Everybody had an opinion yeah. and, and they had a platform, mm. you know, to mm -hmm. sort of talk about it. When does, when does brushy come on that, that deal? I don't know anything about the details. It was rumored. It was like the first million dollar snowboarder contract. But I mean, we, was it we, we made a big deal out of that. Yeah. Um, was it before going was, public or like yeah, was after that, it was after it was, was right think, after it's it was, like, yeah, I we got think the it big was guy. after. I yeah. think it was yeah. after. Yeah. I think it was, I mean, look, they were paying Burton was paying. Yeah. And, they, but Burton couldn't pay everyone. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. I mean, Craig Kelly was probably the biggest guy at the, you know, hundred percent. I don't think anyone was ever bigger than him. Not at that era. No, definitely no, not. That, that, but that Brush, era. I mean, you know. In, well, jo Brush, Jason Ford. Yeah. They, they were sort of the, but the Brush was the, he was the, you know, like the community hero, like of the, of the snowboard community. You loved Brushy. He was the cool guy. He had the dreads. He was just like lanky style. The way he rode was completely his own way. You know what I mean? It was insane. Yeah. And so yeah, brush him was, coming on. Was that like, how does he fit in with like you guys? Does he, does he? Yes. I mean, look, Tim, Tim, Tim can talk to all those people. He can hang with them. He could talk the talk. Yeah. Um, I was more the business guy. Uh, but you look, you look today at, at the way ABG runs, right? There's Nick Woodhouse and there's Jamie Salter and you know, Nick is creative and, 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 you know, marketing and merchandising and product and and i'm more structure of the deal and distribution and you know uh, more m a so left brain right brain you know tim tim was definitely that left side and i was i, I, I was the right side so again it's that's so the snowboarding thing leads into where you are now like you need those two to be in balance do you, do you guys scream at each other you and tim like tim wants to you know, I mean, look, Tim stuff. and I, Tim and I had a, a phenomenal relationship because we sort of, we made money together and, 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 and became wealthy together and, and, uh, a lot of respect. I, I still speak to Tim, you know, a couple times a year. Um, 
you know, funny enough, Tim Tim did come to ABG for a very short moment. Really? And uh, yeah, Tim was working with my partner, Nick. Yeah. Uh, they butted heads a little bit. Okay. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, Tim's, I got huge respect for Tim. Yeah. And if you look at where Jason went to, Jason Ford, like with the media management stuff that he's doing, it's insane. Yeah, Jay, Jason's done very well. Uh, look, a lot of the boys, Mike Taz was done very well. I, 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 a lot of the boys at Ride uh, did well. Markovich yeah. is, you know, retired now, but Markovich, you know, we brought on, uh, I found him at Nike. He was running Nike Canada. Yeah. And I brought him in. I mean, there, there's, there's been, there's no doubt about it that uh, Ride definitely had some, some pretty talented people throughout uh and, and throughout the career there. and it was the first big business snowboard company you know burton was doing it the way that burton was doing it but everybody else was like way down here a couple yeah. hundred to a thousand boards a year kind uh, of thing and barely making and it. by the way we were supplying most of them yeah yeah of course oh yeah you guys bought the thermal factory we own the thermal factory and we controlled a lot of the product uh, production in 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 europe and obviously we had this great relationship with palais and that so, started right yes, from the back right in the from beginning the back in the beginning yeah, so it's incredible we, we definitely you know uh, anyone that wanted to make snowboards uh, i was always a big believer look they're gonna make them anyway so we might as well make them for them so how do you get out of that era like what what takes you out of that era do you so you no. what happened, you, it, you know, my wife said to me one day, it's enough. It's enough. You can't go Seattle to, to Toronto. Uh, you know, you can't do that. And I mean, it's, I mean, I'm going to New York and Toronto every week now, but so I a mean, little bit closer, a little bit closer, a lot if, closer. If the planes closed down, you could drive. But, but the, 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 the truth of the matter was, um, I really want to expand ride into, uh, a, a multi-category Gotcha. business and the board said no we're going to be a pure play in the mm -hmm. snowboard business just like burton and i said mm, not that's I, I don't that's not my vision my vision is to be in multiple categories uh multiple territories uh around the world so um maybe there's someone better than jamie salter and uh smarter than jamie salter and i you know had a lot of stock and i said okay i understand and uh I said, I'm going to be giving my notice. And uh, I gave my notice, I think it was 96, uh, uh, late 95, 96. Yeah. And I left. Um, they hired a great guy. They, you know, they thought they hired a great guy. In yeah. the end, I don't think he was such a great guy. Sure. But they hired Bob. He was running Solomon at the time. Yep. And, and Varney. And um, they brought him on, you know, super smart, right? Talented, knew what he was doing. They thought. Um but he took all the culture away and, 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 and he made it very corporate and he was never really in the building. And, um, yeah, he, he was different individual. He suit tie guy. Um, didn't get along with the snowboarding people so much. Um, and what I did is, is, you know, I did what I did. I set up my new company called, uh, at the time Gen X and, uh, Gen X, uh, became very big. Very fast. Did you, you grabbed a bunch of snowboard brands? I, yeah, I was buying brands. I yeah. created some brands. Yeah, yeah. Lamar, yep. uh, Lamar Snowboards at the time. You I got think, Kemper back at I, one point, didn't you? I had Kemper. I think, yep. I, I, think I bought Sims maybe. <laughs> yeah, I think I, probably. I, yeah, I, I think I did. Oh yeah, I remember when I, think I bought had Sims, Sims Snowboards. And, yeah, yeah. So I, I built up the business, but it wasn't just snowboarding. It was, you know, ultra wheels, inline skates and, 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 and I built the business. And it was a big supplier you know to to multiple huge yeah, yeah. retail ram, chains. ram ram golf uh, Taylor, uh tommy armor golf and it, we we became very big and yeah. uh, we got bought out um and then i retired and uh that was it i'm yeah. i'm done i'm going to yeah. just go and enjoy my money and i'm going to and that lasted a week <laughs> um and i and I, I, I at the end of the week my friend, John Frizzani, called me up and he said, you know, why don't you come work with me? I said, John, I don't need to really work. He says, I'm going to give you a bunch of stock. And that was sport check, right, in Canada. Yeah, Frizzani. Gave group. me a lot of stock. And, and he says, look, we need you. You're important to us. We, you know, you're a great supplier. We buy all these brands from you. you, you you're a huge part of our profits. And I said, okay. I started, you know, Gen X too. 
Yeah. And uh, Gen X2 became uh, very big. And then I, uh, what did I do? I think I did a deal with Michael Rubin, which is GSI. And uh, GSI, which is today Fanatics. And uh, GSI, uh, we you know, we built that business up, me and Michael Rubin. And, you know, Michael's way more famous than me, but also great friend. And Michael and I, we were doing a lot of business in about $250 million. And um, we were partners. And while that was going on, um, something, you know, strange happened. We went to Portland, Oregon. I did. And I met with Mickey Kerbel and Mickey Kerbel windsurfing warehouse, which also owns, you know, snowboard warehouse or whatever it was called back then. Yeah. And he had all these big Packard Bell computers down in his basement. He had gear.com and snowboard.com and extreme.com. And, you know, every computer was a different website. Yeah. I said, what, what is this Mickey? He said, Oh, you know, these are all stores and we're selling them on the internet. And I said, well, all the inventory is mine. (laughs) <laughs> you need to pay me, Mickey. He said, well, I don't have any money to pay you because I'm spending it all on technology. I said, Mickey, it looks like you got 12 computers here. What technology? They're $2,500 <laughs> each. Yeah. He said, no, 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 Jamie, I'm telling you, like a lot of money in technology. I said, I don't understand. I said, Mickey, you need to pay me. You owe us a million dollars. Michael Rubin's going to kill me and you need to pay us. <laughs> so, you know, I went back and I said, Michael, I think there's something here on this internet business. And, and he said, uh, well, what do you think? And I said, I, th- I, I think we can sell a lot of product on the internet. And he goes, okay, so let's go sell to sports I said, well, there is no sports There is no dicks.com. There is no Dunham's.com. He goes, great. Let's license their names. <laughs> and that's where the whole big licensing wow. idea came into play. Wow. And uh, it's brilliant. You know, and I said, that's a good idea. Yeah. And it was Michael's idea. I'm not going to take it away from him. Um, but it was my idea to, to, to go into the internet business. Yeah. So Michael and I, like very quickly, you know, um, we said, let's, let's really go at this. And Michael sort of took the internet idea and he ran with it. And I ran the traditional business. And our business was going phenomenal. And here we are signing up all these people and, you know, business is getting bigger in, 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 in sort of market size, meaning, meaning the enterprise value is worth a lot. We weren't selling anything on the internet yet. And our stock is now $22. Michael's a public company and, you know, I own, I don't know, 3 million shares and Michael owns 5 million shares and there's 15 million shares outstanding and the stock's $22 and I got $60 million and I go, Michael, like this is good. You're doing a good job. Stock goes from 20 to 12 and like one day I call Michael. I go, Michael, what happened? He goes, what do you mean what happened? The stock went down. I said, I I know. I just lost a lot of money. (laughs) And he goes, well, we're doing a money raise and we're raising money. We need money for the internet. And I said, Michael, what, like, what did you do? And, you know, he, he says, well, I went to this company and they're going to, I said, Michael, they just sold all your stock and now we're going to do a deal with them. And, 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 and quite frankly, this is not fair. Okay. Like these guys are screwing us. He goes, well, what do you want me to do? We need the money. I said, cancel the deal. How much does it cost? He says, 50 grand. So he cancels the deal. Stock goes back up because they got to buy all the stock because they thought that they were going to get delivery from us. Stock goes back to like 17 or 18 or something like that. And yeah. Michael uh, gets a call from Motowishi Sun from SoftBank, literally from SoftBank, who's now like one of the biggest investors in the world. And he says, I'll buy, you know, a, a third of, of your company wow. sorry, for, or maybe it's two thirds or something, but for $80 million. <laughs> oh, wow. But you have to sell all the bricks and mortar companies because we lose money in the internet business. And I said, what do you mean we lose money? And he says, no, no, no. He told me that we should lose money, that we should just build the business, build the business, build the business. Sure enough, all these companies that are doing great, they don't make any money. Right. So I said, well, look, if, if that's the business that you guys are going to run, I'm very happy to buy 
sort of the bricks and mortar companies um, from you. And, and I bought them. Uh, sure enough, because I had four kids at the time. And for me, it was a make, about making a dollar. And for Mike, it was about really, you know, sort of building this big internet business. And um, I was right. Stock went, you know, from 20 to a dollar. So I made the right decision. Um, I was wrong when Michael said, Jamie, you need to invest in me now. I'm going to be huge. Right. And that was a big mistake in my life. And uh, I blame myself. I really blame my partner, but I can't blame my partner because I make my own decisions. Right. But I didn't do it. And, uh, I regret it to this day. Um, Michael wouldn't talk to me for a few years. Um, very upsetting for me because, you know, I, I respect Michael Rubin immensely. He's one of my best friends in the world and, and I love him and he's like the uncle to my kids and, and, and it hurt me. Um, yeah. but I, I worked on that relationship and we got together a couple of years, you know, three years, four years later. And, you know, that was a long time ago. And, Michael is, you know, to this day is, 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 is been a great friend. Um, and sure enough, you know, Michael prevailed and sold his company at $38 a share Oof. to eBay and made two and a half billion dollars. Oh, so wow. I clearly made a mistake. <laughs> um, but I haven't done so bad for myself. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it, it was, it was, it was, a, it was a learning, you know, moment for me. Uh, and it taught me a lot you know, just about relationships and partnerships and do the right thing. And, you know, it's not just about money. It's, it, it, it's, it's about, it's really about doing the right thing. Um, but then I went on and, and I, you know, really created something special. I, I, I went to work at Hilco, uh, did that for four years and I bought Polaroid and I bought Sharper Image and I bought, um, Ellen Tracy and bought all these companies and, um, I did that for four years and business was going well. We invested about 225 million. So it was a lot. Um, got an offer to sell the business for 450 million. I went to my partner my partner said, no, you know, we could get more. And I said, no, that's a fair price. And, um, and then my partner, um, fired me three months later. And I said, why are you firing me? He says, well, I don't like you anymore. I said, why? And he says, well, you, you want to buy the company and you want to sort of go and do it all on your own. I said, well, Jeff, you know, Hilco, it's, it's a liquid, you're a liquidator and I don't want to be a liquidator. I want to be a builder. I'm a builder. I'm not a liquidator. So we're not a good match. He said, well, I own two thirds, you own a third. So I'm going to do what I want to do and you're gone. And that was 12 years ago. Hilco's never bought any IP since that day. Um, and they're still a liquidator. And we started ABG. And my son and I, and we, we, we started it. And we were two. And then there were three. And then we were four. And here we are sort of... Uh, 12 years later, you know, we've got a couple hundred people here at ABG that manage the business. Um, the company is all over the world. It's got 1,100 partners. There's, I don't know how many employees we have around the world with, that work with us and our, our, our partners. I know, you know, just in Spark alone, which is one of our companies, has 30,000 people. Uh, JC Penney's has 60,000 people. <laughs> So, you know, just, just in those two operating companies, we, we have 90,000, you know, sort of, you know, people that we, 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 we put food on their table and we've built an incredible culture here at ABG, which is partnered with best in class partners all over the world. Um, and, and make sure that we try to keep this family atmosphere, uh, going and, and, and I got to tell you, it's not easy. Um, but we're all humble. Uh, we're happy. And, uh, we're having a great time and, you know, we're just trying to accomplish something and, you know, sort of one day at a time. Yeah. You took us through the showrooms of, I mean, some of the brands that you guys have, it's such a huge company. It's the biggest little company <laughs> where we are little, like we're, we're just, we're just a tight group here, but yes, it's a very large company. 
Uh, we're the second largest consumer licensing company in the world behind Disney. Jesus. And we're proud of sort of what we've accomplished. Um, I have incredible people around me. Uh, I, I could never be where I am today without my partners, without my employees, um, and most importantly, without my family. And my family is, is, is really the most important thing in my life. Um, and I, I just, I, I can't say enough things about them because without them, I, I, I wouldn't be here, um, today. They're the biggest support that I have. So, uh, I'm super excited. I'm super blessed. And most importantly, I'm super happy. Yeah. You could see, you could see you're healthy, man. Like, uh, you're healthy and vibrant. That's I'm a, dope. I'm a, I'm a little fat and I'm a little short, but yeah, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. <laughs> so how often do you get, do you, do you ever go out snowboarding? Is that something? Oh that yeah. You, I snowboard yeah. every year. Yeah. Would you take a heli trip or would you just go to the resorts? I've been to uh, Island Lake Lodge. Oh, um, nice. I've heli born in Salt Lake, but uh, we go to, we go to Telluride all the time. Beautiful. Yeah, gorgeous, gorgeous yeah. place. T Tim introduced me to Telluride way back in the day with yeah. my my brother, and my brother still has a place there. And it's got yeah, such I, a I rad vibe. It. Yeah, it's a really, really cool spot, huh? Yeah, Jamie, I want to thank you for doing the show. It's incredible. Your story is nuts. I, uh, I think there's not an awful lot of people in snowboarding in the industry itself that made a lot of money. Like it's it's one of those industries where there was like two or three guys that were actually Remember, doing it's, it. It's not money. Yeah. Money's a scorecard. Right. Right. Um, I love to golf. Right. I'm not really good at it. Right. Right. So I, I can, I can only tell you that, uh, it, it, it's a great accomplishment. I, 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 I agree with you, but the bigger accomplishment for me is, is the people around me to see them grow and see my kids grow. Uh, that's what makes me happy and, and, and exciting. Um, the fact that this company has just purchased Reebok, uh, one of the largest, you know, footwear companies in the world. Um, it, it, it blows me away. Yeah, so, so I'm not going to tell you that I'm not like, Oh my God. Wow. I wake up every morning. Wow. Yeah. Um, but it, it really is about the people I'm surrounded by. Sick. Yeah. Well, I got, I got the bug in my ear to get in touch with you when I heard you bought Volcom. I was like, really? Oh, that, well, I need to talk to that guy because I knew of your history. And I was like, he's still buying snowboard companies? This is, you know, 30 years later. This is insane. But then, you know, listen, I've tried to buy Burton a few times. Maybe one day Donna will sell it to me. I mean, let, Donna, I want to buy Burton snowboards when you're listening to this. Call me. Awesome, man. I'm talking to Chip Wilson, too. You probably want to buy Love his Chip. thing. Love Chip. Yeah. Chip, I'm yeah. very, Chip and I know each other. We talk all the time. Yeah. Um, Chip and I are talking about uh, actually one of his companies to become partners with us. In, oh, sweet. In, in uh, China. Um, you know, uh, they, he, they own Anta, as you know, and, uh, Wilson and, and, uh, so Chip and I, uh, uh, we have a good history, you know, Moro snowboards, West beach. Yeah. Uh, huge respect for that guy. That yeah. guy is, he's, he's wow. He's done an unbelievable yeah. job with Lululemon. So yes. And, and I'm still friends with Kevin Jardine and Jeez. you know, all these people that sort of go back and yeah. created all this stuff. Yeah. It all comes out of this whole, you know, David Kemper. How did he even get your guy's number? I have no idea. <laughs> Do you no ever idea. talk to David? Is he, is he still around? No, I, do I don't not. even know where he is. I, I, I mean, I, I don't know if he's in Toronto. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I probably should be better on Facebook and Instagram yeah, and stuff like yeah. that, but I, I, I try to stay off social media as a general rule. Yeah. Um, but I'm going to look him up now that we've done this interview oh, and see if, I can, see if I can find him. Yeah. And don't be surprised if you get a call from Donna. <laughs> well, listen, thank you so much for your time. This is, this was super fun. Dude, so um, much fun. This is the, you know, I haven't done anything like this ever for, oh, that's for, great, for a ride. So yeah, yeah, yeah. This yeah. was kind of cool. And, you know what? Uh, Thanks like for, for all your contributions. You know, I was, I'm the grommy kid that's always looking for the most core thing when I was growing up. So, you know, I probably would have been anti-corporate stuff for a really long time, but this is really fun. 
the two different paths lead to two completely different places. I still snowboard a lot, but I don't make a lot of money. <laughs> well, listen, you'll hang out with fun. me and I'll hang out with you. <laughs> I'll work less yeah, and I'll snowboard more All and right. then I'll teach you a few things. Yeah, for sure. I'll take you out sledding. Okay. Awesome, man. Have a great one. Yeah, you too. Bye-bye. Thanks, Jamie. Eff and Rad shout outs to Jamie Salter and his whole family. Thanks for living the crazy life you've led and helping to shape the snowboarding industry. Shout outs to Volcom and specifically Tyler Element and his crew at Heat Seeker Sales for keeping me set up with Volcom outerwear and accessories. Be sure to come back next week for another episode of the F and Rad Snowboard Podcast presented by Vans and brought to you by SIA Productions. <laughs>